All right, so our next speaker uh, is Henry Bodden. He's a full-time faculty member in game design at Columbus State. He's also the founder of Bodden Studios, uh, and we've worked together on some things in the past, so big hand for Henry. Make sure this is working. I'm gonna screw up the stage a bit just because I'm a pacer. I like to move. As soon as I stand still, my brain for some reason stops working. But take this off too. I suddenly seem older and wiser, don't I? All right, uh, so before we get started, I just kind of want to get a feel for the crowd. If I say red shirts, how many of you catch the reference? All right. Did any of you get into stuff like Hi Hi Puffy Ami Yumi? <laughs> so, okay, see, you can admit it, it's okay. <laughs> Let's see. Moles and trolls, moles and trolls. Work, 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 work. Anybody catch that reference? Okay, so I'm kind of getting a feel for this audience. A lot of times it's really interesting. Audiences, you can kind of tell what they're into based off of the media that they take in. Uh, D20, how many of you understand that? Okay, so a little <laughs> bit more. Once again, how many of you are students? I saw quite a few hands when he asked earlier. How many of you are currently game developers? Maybe you're not getting paid for it yet, but you're making your own games. Okay, so pretty decent audience. All right, well, I'm going to be talking about setting goals today. Before that, I like to do a little warming up, so me, me, me. All right, there's a not really interesting things you can do with your voice. Have any of you tried? How many of you do voice acting? Singing? Dancing? Okay, but that's not with your voice. Okay, so voice, you can do things like, you know, tightening up and constraining your throat. You can even get to the point where you're talking really high, which, you know, leads to Mickey Mouse, and uh, you can get Elmo if you really kind of crank it a little bit, uh, or you go lower and maybe take a Scottish accent. Mm. And you switch things around. But then you can also jump in a song. So let me get a couple hands clapping because I want to make sure you're all awake for this. So let's get a good even beat. Imagine me and you, and you and me. No matter how they toss the dice, it had to be. The only one for me is you, and you for me. So happy together. Okay, you all know that song? Okay, who, who sang that song? Who? Turtles. turtles, thank you. And that leads us to the Ninja Turtles, which once again, how many of you got the original action figures? Weren't they awesome? Okay, cool. So some people from my generation, a little bit. All right, well, we'll just move on right now. So, all right, uh, sing a song. Check. All right, so who am I? My name's Henry Bodden. Uh, I am quite a few different things. I'm a husband and a father. I'm a teacher. I'm a game developer. Nobody's just one thing, even though we like to identify ourselves as, oh, I'm a, I'm a gamer. I'm a hardcore gamer. We're actually a lot of different things. But more than that, I'm someone who's successful. That doesn't mean I succeed at everything. I make a lot of mistakes. I fail more often than I succeed. But I am successful. I reach my goals. I've been able to do a lot of things in my life, and that's what I'm here to talk with you about. So, I have three rules for success. Now, in the words of the immortal, but recently deceased George Carlin, my rules, I make them up. Okay, so because this is my presentation, there are three rules for success. First, you gotta not be afraid to fail. If you're afraid to fail, then you never get around to doing anything. So don't be afraid to fail. Look at it as an opportunity. Second, you got to set goals. Otherwise, you just kind of meander aimlessly. And the third, you got to do something about it. All the planning in the world won't get you anywhere without some form of action. So that's what this talk's going to be about. So I'll start with a good quote. You all should know this guy, Walter Elias Disney. So, all the adversity I've had in my life, all my troubles and obstacles have strengthened me. You may not realize it when it happens, but a kick in the teeth may be the best thing in the world for you. And for anybody who's actually read about Walt Disney, uh, there's quite a few really good biographies about his life. He had a lot of things that went wrong. For as big of a success as he was, and as much as he is a household name now, he had a lot of failures before he got to those successes. So don't be afraid to fail. 
So with setting goals, there's a couple things that you can do that are good practice. Um, and that's what I want to focus in on is this practical approach to setting goals. How many people here have actually written down a goal before? Not just thought about it, but actually written it down. Good, you're going to be more successful because of that. So let's talk about what we can do with them. So first of all, just in writing it down, there's a power in writing down goals. This is when uh, a goal that I wrote when I was 12, okay? I was trying to uh, get on all the paperwork for my Eagle project, and so I had to fill out a section for what my goals were. Uh, I want to go to college, major in electronic programming and art. I want to work for a video game, or I want to go to a video game college uh, as soon as I get out of college, and I want to work for Nintendo or, you know, uh, a video game making company like Taito. Uh, and then that other thing was for my dad because he told me I had to be a doctor or surgeon or something. <laughs> But there's power in writing it down. That was written down when I was 12. At the time, I had no concrete plans for doing this. I just liked games. I liked art. And I kind of had a feel for where I wanted to go with it. And so just by writing that down, it starts to develop a power. OK, the next step is to work from big to small. So you need to start by writing your larger goal. What is it that you're shooting for? And the more specific you are, the easier it's going to be to hit that goal. Then you break it into components. And then you break those into smaller components. And then you keep doing that until you have action items. That's a big problem with our goals is we say, I want to do this. Now what? OK. So we'll start with an example. Someone could say, I want to be an artist. You could equally say, I want to be a program or whatever else, which is fine. But it's not really specific. What kind of an artist? Do I want to be someone who does tattoos out of a back alley? Do I want to be uh, a fine artist? Do I want to be a gallery artist? Do I want to do figurative art, landscape? There's a lot of different directions you can go with this. And you don't always have to know exactly where you want to go. A lot of that comes through experimentation. Say, so, yeah, I want to be an artist. Well, let me try this kind. Let me try this kind. You find out kind of as you go what you do want to do and what you don't want to do. But to help it out a little bit, we can be a little more specific. So in this case, I want to be a character concept artist. Not me. I'm not that great a concept artist. I do other things. But for the example. So we start by listing things we need to do to become a character concept artist. So I need, first of all, develop the skills to be able to be a character concept artist. I need to build some kind of portfolio so that I can show it and hopefully get work and be able to do more. And I need to make connections. You can't get jobs or work in this field without having some kind of connection. The next step is to take those, uh, if this works, and break those down. So to develop skills, I might go to school, go to local life drawing studios, keep a sketchbook. For the portfolio, I'll do things, making connections. Yet again, keep a blog, participate in design groups. And, and this is a very short list. When you actually get down to writing these, these lists get big. But it gives you more ideas of what to do. But this isn't the end. Oh, it gets better. Then you come back and you say, OK, go to school. What do I need to do? I need to find a school with a good program. I need to register for classes. I need to make sure that I get in my transcripts. OK, uh, Life Drawing Studio has got to figure out where they're available. We need to go attend weekly, uh, draw three hours a day, try new mediums each week. Oh, and it gets better. OK, so create one new character every day. Create a story world that the characters will be in. Start building up all sorts of different designs. Figure out how I'm going to implement this, how this is going to be part of my brand. Figure out website stuff. And then I'm going to keep a blog and uh, participate in character design groups and build and build and build and build. <sighs> Say hi to Doomcat, everybody. Okay. Okay, so I made you look at the cat. Good. We're, we're all set. <clears throat> this can get overwhelming really quickly. Uh, for anybody who's tried to do this type of itemization, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of things that come up. But a couple key points to take away is you need to work this down. This may not be the end level. You may go down seven or eight or nine more levels before you get to the itemized things of your action items. What do I need to do? What can I actually accomplish? Rather than just saying, I want to be an artist, I may not be able to just jump in and suddenly I'm this great artist, but I can sit down and start drawing in a sketchbook tonight. And so that's the level you need to get these goals to to make it really practical. Uh, then you can start taking those action items and figure out when you're going to do it. Because when you get down to the end, you go, OK, well, I've got about 33 hours of stuff that I've got to do every day in order to reach this goal. 
not really feasible. So where can I put these action items? Well, maybe I can sketch for a few hours every night right before I go to sleep. Maybe I can sneak in a Wednesday uh, for a couple hours at a life drawing studio. Uh, for school, when can I fit that in? Um, but above all that, you need to not lose sight of the big picture. So we'll continue on. The other thing to remember is each part of the goal, or your goal is uh, only part of your life goal. Why do you make games? Have you thought about it? I mean, more than just, well, I like making games. I like playing games, so obviously I like making them. There's something larger. In general, people have this kind of a larger life goal. I want to be happy. I want to feel fulfilled. Games do that for me. I enjoy playing them. I feel satisfaction out of creating something. So there's actually a larger life goal. So this is one. I want to be a character concept artist because I believe that's going to help me reach this larger goal. Yet again, remember, eye on the prize, the big picture goal. But this is only one of many. And even in game development, I have seen too many people go through divorces during crunch time. I have seen too many people end up in the hospital during crunch time. It, it, you got to balance it. So as you're pursuing these goals, don't lose sight of everything else. Because as you balance your life, as you find ways of making this all fit in that larger goal, you're going to find that you're better at what you're shooting for. You're going to be a better game developer because you stop and you go for a walk with your kids once in a while and you look at nature. You're going to be a better programmer as you go fishing once in a while and you start noticing the relationship between things. Oh, this tension. Hey, I could use this for a programming algorithm. Inspiration comes from everywhere. So you have to lead kind of a balanced life as you're focusing on these goals. So remember, it's always looking at that larger goal and then working your way down. OK, who knows who this is? OK, Wicked Wistry Wark. Not just any Ewok, this one's special. OK, but anyway, so I needed a segue. I didn't have one. That works. All right, so now on to a project example, because that's kind of a life goal type thing. So in the case of a project, it's the same thing. We say, we have something we're shooting for, which is great. I want to build an airplane. <laughs> that's fine, but I can't just you know, go into my garage and throw one together. There's a lot that goes into it. You have to break it down its components, build each one separately, and then put it together for the final product. OK, so once again, here's an example. I want to make a game. There's a problem here. It's not specific enough. Because just saying, I want to make a game is fine, but without any direction. Th this is the, the blank canvas problem. Uh, when I was going to college, I was actually in a traditional drawing and painting program. And the worst thing was when you had an assignment to do a painting, and you'd sit down in front of that blank canvas and just looked at it. It's like, well, I can do anything. It's an open-ended assignment. I just have to paint something. And it's really hard to do sometimes because there's no direction. There's no, you know, you're, you're trying to develop these skills. You want to get a good grade. I'm waiting for that inspiration to come. It's better if you have a goal. So making it specific, if I had just sat down and gone, well, I want to do a painting about this, describing this, then suddenly I've got a direction. So I'm going to make an RPG about what it's like to be a marine biologist living in Alaska. Specific enough for you? OK. So same thing. We break it down into the smaller goals. So we want to do the design for the game, and then we've got to do the programming. We need to get art made for this. We've got to get music. We've got to do cinematics. And by no means is this a full list. And then we break that down. So once again, so to design the game, we've got to do research, create a game design document. And you keep going down, and you do that for all of it. And you take it to the next step, and the next step, and the next step. Guess what? This is what you do for your team. You say, OK, now here are the action items. Here's what you're working on. Here's what you're working on. Here's what you're working on. Here's what we need to meet together next week to check to get this game built. You have to break it down into actual components and steps. What are you going to actually do to get this done? So I'm going to jump back a little bit. So that's kind of like an overall project approach. But even within there, there are different components, different ideas you want to work on. And especially with game design, this is where I see a lot of problems. How many of you that are uh, game designers here have jumped into a game because you had this great mechanic you've been playing with? OK, how many jumped in because you went, oh, I just have this art style I want to share? OK, a few. How many of you jumped in going, I got this great story. Now we need some kind of game around it. <laughs> but you lose perspective of what 
the big picture is. You're like, well, I want to make a game, and I want to show this. Eh, it doesn't always work. The big question to ask is, what is the gameplay experience? Once again, we're looking at the larger goal. What is the experience we're trying to share? Uh, it, the same license, but very different experiences if these were each made into a game. Okay, so I'm going to be specific with my game design. So I'm going to create the experience of being a modern day marine biologist living on a boat around Ketchikan, Alaska. Guess what? We're back to the lists. Okay, so to do this design, I need story, characters, environments, mechanics, art, music, cinematics, and on and on and on and on. Well, we break those down. So I need to define the story structure. And each time I do this with the game design, it's got to tie back into the top. So does this story help share the experience? If it does, great. If it doesn't, ax it, redo it. I need to define the characters. If I have a, a goofy southerner, you know, living on the water with a shotgun, to, Maybe that's fun and quirky, but does that really share that overall experience? And we go through the rest of it the same way and break it down. And this is how you start defining it. All right. We're on to keep positive now. Yes. All right. So Star Trek reference. Got it. A big thing to remember is you're not going to reach all of your action items. As you work on these lists, whether it is for a personal goal, uh, whether it's at a company, uh, or even if it's in a, a design thing, you're never going to get everything done. There's always too much to do. Um, just like the last speaker was saying, and thank you, um, you have to make sure that you focus in on things. You've got to know which good things to throw out. Because all of it can be good, but you've only got 24 hours in a day. You've only got seven days in a week, and there's other life things that come up. So you're not going to reach all of your action items, which is fine. It, it, by the way, this is my uh, youngest son right now. This was his birthday party. If he had gotten lost in the fact that he couldn't get both candles at once, he would have lost sight of the bigger picture. What was the bigger picture here? Cake. Birthday cake! Presents! If he had gotten lost in the fact that that one thing didn't happen, it would have ruined everything else. So don't worry about it. Keep focused on the larger goals. And the cool thing you're going to find is that as you do that, as you look at the larger goals and you do these action items, even though you may screw things up, you'll miss steps along the way, you'll find that you reach those larger goals. I missed a lot of action items. I had more fun than I should have. I uh, had weeks where I was sick, and so I couldn't meet those daily goals and those weekly goals. Well, guess what? I was still able to reach the larger goals. The point is that you have steps to work towards. Final thing is that you need to do something. After you've gone and written down all your goals, yet again, in a practical way, sit down, write them down break them into components, break them into subsections, and go down until you have stuff you can do, is that you have to act on them. It's not enough just to plan. Don't procrastinate. I, I don't know if any of you are independently wealthy. If you are, please call me. I've got a couple of awesome ideas. Um, but most of us are starting out kind of, well, where we are. Don't waste time waiting until you can afford the perfect machine or the perfect game engine. Speaker earlier talked about ways you can get things for cheap or for free in order to start developing. Start now. You don't have to wait until you can afford that awesome Cintiq to draw on. There's paper and pretty much any copier here on campus uh, that you can, you know, I've met a, quite a few artists back in the day that were like really old school graphic designers and they started with, you know, cardboard that people had thrown out and charcoal that they had burned themselves because they couldn't afford pencils. Okay, y You can start anywhere. Go out, draw in the sand. My kids do game design. They pull out Legos and blocks and they're Mario going along and look at this level, Dad. You, know? you don't have to have a lot of money to get started. So just get started. Don't make excuses. Also, don't plan forever. Check things off your action list. I love getting those little check marks. Ah, oh, so nice. <laughs> Stay passionate. If you're doing something, if you're working towards a goal, and you're finding that your passion for it is starting to go away, it's like, wow, this really isn't what I enjoy doing. And if you find that it's a chore to do it, then you probably shouldn't keep pursuing that path. 
That's when you kind of restructure and refocus. It's okay to change your goals. The goals I had when I was 12 and the goals I have now are very different. Some are the same. Some are things that I have accomplished, but I've got different priorities now. Uh, learn as much as you can. A big part of all of this, and the other speakers brought this up too, is that you need to continue learning. It's not enough just to go to college. All right, I teach at a college, so I encourage you to go to college. Um, but even my students, I try and explain to them that if you just do enough to get through classes, you're never going to succeed in the video game industry. You have to love what you're doing. You have to do projects at home. School should supplement and support the cool stuff you're doing at home. Take the skills you learn at school. Use it as a way to develop skills, but then work on your own stuff. Be passionate about it. Learn as much as you can. And, and yet again, don't just play games to learn how to make games. You, you don't just go to galleries to learn how to make art. You got to explore things. You got to do stuff. Date once in a while might be good. Uh, go for long walks. Listen to music. Anything you need to. Do something and, you know, have fun. Learn. Uh, read a book. You know, whatever you can. Keep learning. Keep growing. Also, yet again, restructure when necessary because your goals are going to change. And you'll find that even in the middle of projects, things go bad. That's why people have switched over to agile and lean development. You want to be able to change things on the fly. You're still shooting for that larger goal, but there may be better pathway or pathways to get there. So you may have to change what you're doing to be able to find a better balanced approach. And finally, don't give up. Okay, that's the big one because you are going to fail. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. All of you will fail over and over and over again. But you'll see successes as well. And through those failures and successes, you're going to learn a lot. The more you fail, the better off you're going to be because I learn more from failing than I do from succeeding. I succeed, it's like, oh, that's great. And then I do it again. It's like, wait, it went wrong this time. And I don't know how to fix it. But if I fail on something, and I have to fight it, and I have to keep working at it, if it comes up again, I know how to fix it then next time. So don't give up. You're going to see failures, but look at it in a positive way. It's a learning experience. Keep moving on. Reset your goals, and don't quit. The only time you truly fail is when you stop trying. All right, now back to the beginning pictures. This is when I get into the fun stories. All right. We all know what that is up there, right? evil little vermin. They're wonderful, but horrible at the same time. As a family, we decided to set some goals this year um, to try and find ways to be more self-sufficient and also just kind of an excuse for me and my wife to have activities with our children rather than having them just come home and reading or playing games and stuff like that. We want to actually do stuff that would be meaningful for them. And so this was part of some personal goals that me and my wife set. Uh, so this year we've had all sorts of fun experiments. Uh, I learned to make kimchi and sauerkraut in my basement. And the sauerkraut didn't work the first few times. <laughs> kimchi was fantastic, but too hot the first couple times. Uh, but I started keeping bees this year. And it worked. See that at the end? That was great. We have honey. Oh my, we have honey after all that. Yeah, we failed over and over and over again. Somehow it succeeded in the end. I had no idea what to do. I read some books and I you know, watched YouTube videos. So obviously I was informed. I was a champion with this. It's like <laughs> beekeeping is going to be easy. I've, I've seen it. Yeah, uh, my first queen was rejected by the hive, so I had to get a new queen. Um, then we went through a weird kind of drought. They didn't have food, so I had to supplement that. Then we got varroa mites, which were about decimated the hive. And then I had hive beetles move in and wax larvae. This hive, I, am, I was ready to give up. I thought it was dead quite a few times. It's like, okay, well, I'm not ever going to be a beekeeper. At the end, somehow it worked out. But all along the way, it was week by week, I'd be coming to talk to my friends and going to work and it's like, how's the hive doing? <laughs> <laughs> so is it doing good? Yeah. In the end, we, we did get a honey harvest and I hope they make it through the winter. So that's kind of like all these other goals. We set goals, we work towards them, we fail a lot. Even if the hive had died, guess what? We're going to do it again next year. And each year that we do it, our family's going to get better at it. And yet again, it wasn't about the bees. 
It was about that larger goal, having my kids experience stuff, being able to try new things, learning new processes, having new experiences, the larger goals. Suzicious so Adventure. This is like on my beekeeping experiment. Uh, it's a game that I've been working on for quite a while, trying to get my own game studio going here. Uh, before I came here, when I first started, uh, I was working for a company called Sensory Sweep in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, you probably wouldn't have heard of them. They are non-existent now. They're one of the many studios that went under, 2008-2009-ish. Uh, and I came from developing platform type games. And so when everything kind of fell apart there, yet again, those life goals, they don't always go the way you want them to. But we ended up moving out here to Ohio, and I started teaching. And it was nice, because this is something I also had wanted to do. It came earlier than expected. That was one of those life goals that I'd written down. I figured, yeah, when I'm you know, like 50 or 60 and done with the game industry and burned out, then I'll go into teaching. It came early. And it's actually been a wonderful opportunity, because it's something that is very fulfilling for me, and it allows me the freedom to create stuff. But Ish's Adventure is one of a lot of the games that I kind of planned when I first got here. It's like, okay, now I'm going to get in this indie market and, you know, just jump in and start doing it. And it has been problem after problem, but it's been a great learning experience. This last year, I was excited. It's like, oh, great, I'm going to release it on iPhone and Android. It's the beginning of the year, lots of energy. We had some issues with that. I ended up having to change it over, so I've been spending the last while trying to convert everything from JavaScript to C-sharp. And at the beginning of the year, I didn't know C-sharp, so it's been a process. But this is another thing where, you know, set goals, still have action items. I still have work I'm doing every day on it. Same with all the other games I'm involved with and the other projects I'm involved with. There's always stuff to do. Don't take the failures as a bad thing. Guess what? Next year, hopefully you all will be able to bug me about this. I'm hoping to be able to show it. Shooting for an Android release of a partially finished version at the end of the month. This is a goal. I may fail, but guess what? I'm going to keep trying. And the same thing should be said for all of you. Even if you don't succeed, the first, the second, the third, uh, the panel earlier, 100 games, you have one that succeeds or does financially really well, that takes off. That's a lot of failures. So stop looking at them as failures. Say, hey, that's just another step. We're going to keep moving, we're going to keep setting goals, and we're going to succeed. As long as you keep that attitude, and as long as you keep making meaningful steps forward, you will succeed. All right, uh, to get to this. So uh, once again, this is my name. I teach at Columbus State Community College. I'm in charge of the video game art and animation program. And so for you that are out there that want to learn a little bit more about that or have uh, education related questions, please contact me at that email. For anybody that has other types of questions, uh, game development, et cetera, please contact me at the bottom. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, I. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so I was just asking my game development peers the same question. And in the slide, you know, you know, I think it was like do it or, you know, get it done or something like mm -hmm. that. You talked about like not giving up. And sort of my hallmark with my game development projects is I get to about 80%. And it like looks good and I show it to people. It's playing pretty good, you know, and then there's like this minutia of like, you know, finishing it. You know, that last 10% that's going to take the same amount of time as the first 80%. And I always sort of like pitter out and lose steam. And I guess I was curious if you experienced that in your projects. And, and, and what do you do to get around it? Like, like other than just saying, don't give up. Well, for me, the big thing is you need to take a little bit of time to get away from it for a little bit. Not a lot of time. If you say, OK, I just need a break, and you don't give yourself a specific time to get back, you may never get back. But I'll give myself a, a specific amount of time and go, OK, for the next week, I am not touching this. I'm going to step away from it. And then you come back. You actually have to follow through with that, and you reapproach it. And the biggest thing, Ish is a perfect example. I have had to start from basically scratch three times on it now because of different issues. Um, and so even at the beginning of the year, that was a blow. I mean, that was like a full body blow. So, okay, I've been working on this for two years now. I'm ready to get it out. And yet again, not completely finished. It was like, I'm going to get this portion out and then build up the final levels as I start generating revenue. 
it was a body blow to go, okay, I have to start from scratch again. I've got some of the art assets will still work. I may have to convert some of these things. I've got to optimize this other stuff, but I've got to learn a whole new language. I've got to optimize for different screen sizes. I don't know how to do that. And so it's like, I, I, okay, well, do I just throw the last two years of work away and start with something fresh? It's like, no, this is a, a good idea, a good product. I've still got other games that I'm doing as well. I've got other projects on the side, but I feel like this is something that I still want to pursue. And again, this is where you reevaluate and go, is it worth that time or is it not? Um, making those judgment calls as well. But in my case, it's like, yeah, I do want to do this. So I needed to take a little bit of time off and breathe, you know, go down, cry in a corner for a little while and go, okay, back to square one, back to... <laughs> and sometimes that happens. And, and even in life, how many of you have lost a job at some point in your life? Okay, you're part of the good club. Okay, there's a lot of us. That's a body blow. It's like, oh, back to square one. Now where do I look? What do I do? I, I'm nobody again. I, I, I used to be well. Now I'm down here. What do I do? And, and it's just saying, okay, I need to set goals. I need to move on. So take some time away, first of all, but limit that time. No more than a week at the most. Because if you go a month, well, then that thing's lost. Um, you know, sometimes it's only like stepping out and going, okay, whew, I need to walk for five minutes, then I'll come back. Sometimes it's short, but give yourself a limited amount of time take a breather, come back, and then, yet again, reevaluate your goals. Okay, what am I shooting for with this? What is my end goal? What do I need to do to get there from here? So, and you're right, at that end, uh, when they were talking earlier about production time, if you're new to developing games, or if you've only done a couple, even if you're professional, we always find that it kind of leaks a little bit. Whatever time you're planning on doing, it's always a conservative estimate, plan on at least three times that much. So if you're going, oh, I'll get this done in three months, plan on nine at least. <laughs> so expect that, that there's going to be challenges. So sorry, I'm a little long-winded with that. Any other questions? Hi, thanks for that really uh, informative talk. I think that helped a lot of us. Now this is coming from a programming background, but it might help others in the audience as well. I was wondering, um, when you're talking about something like programming or art or music or business, there's a lot of established avenues of I'm going to get some specialization and I'm going to learn how to do this or just even pick it up if you need to. But for game design, I feel like that can be a little harder to pin down. And I know I and probably a lot of other people have been a little curious about, you know, how do I game design? Where, where does that come from? Do you have any suggestions or just... Uh, uh, things to say about uh, someone wanting to learn the game design side of things specifically where they would look to, what resources they might leverage. Yeah, um, there's actually a lot of really good information for uh, game designers out there. I would recommend, uh, there's a book called Level Up by Scott Rogers. Uh, he's a professional game designer, um, really good book. Uh, game design is kind of a, a funny thing. It's one of those positions in the industry that kind of comes and goes and has a lot of different meanings. Uh, early developers, when you're talking like beginning of the game industry, these were you know one and two man teams developing games. They were the designers. Designers was kind of synonymous with programmers at the time. Um, and, and over time as we got into the much larger studios, you know, the 50 man teams, the 100 man teams, things like that, design became a specialty in and of itself. But now as we're kind of reapproaching the, the smaller teams again, design is usually picked up by other people on the team as well. The programmers will take a role in design, the artists take a role in design. And, and you know, it's kind of as it should be. If you want to keep everybody involved in the project, uh, it's an important thing to do. I would say if you want to really design, figure out what area of design you're looking at and then check the viability for it. Uh, they mentioned Gama Sutra, it's a good website. You can check the job postings there, see what they're looking for in designers. Um, otherwise, pick up a, like a secondary specialty or something that you can do as well. A lot of designers I worked with had something that they did extremely well. Uh, they would be people that could script as well, so they could do some of the basic programming. The programmers give them the tools, they would excuse me, in addition to their design, start laying out, okay, this door opens here, this opens here. Um, others were focused as storytellers, so they may have had a background in playwriting or in story writing of some other sort. And so they would not only write stories and dialogue and things like that uh, as part of the design process, but they would also look at overall design and how that fit in the overall gameplay. Um, and in that case, you'd be looking at more of a specialized studio, like BioWare really has that focus on storytelling. So that would be a type of place to look at. But 
but make sure you figure out kind of where you want to go within design. Because if you just say design, that's, yet again, very broad-based goals versus something specific you can work towards. If you say, I want to be a storytelling designer, I want to focus on story, then you've got something to work towards. And then it's not just working on video games telling stories, then it's writing stories for movies, writing scripts, writing plays, uh, short novels, whatever else. And that way you've got a, a marketable set of skills that you can actually use. Uh, too many times in the game industry we say designer is kind of a cop-out, like, well, I don't have actual skills, but I like playing games, I like talking about games, I'm going to be a designer. And so it, it's about actually finding what skill set you want to develop as a designer. So. Uh, other questions? Cool. And then I think there's someone over here after. So. Hey, yes. thanks for the talk. That was very um, helpful. So um, I was wondering if you could talk about financial agreements between like partnerships. I would think that doing a creative project like this is like being in a band, right? Like you've got your different groups, it's all messy, it's creative. How uh, Do you have uh, either a horror story about working in a team and trying to break up the profits or like a just legal agreements, financial agreements, how do you make this work between a team and it's messy? I would really like to get enough money coming in that I have that problem. <laughs> no, but uh, let me actually answer it <laughs> though. Um, yeah, in the past there have been a, a lot of issues with that, especially uh, I've attended a few GDCs and that's one of the big things that everybody, oh my goodness, make sure you get everything written. And so uh, the first time I tried starting my studio was actually right after uh, the studio I was working on Salt Lake collapsed. Um, I screwed everything up. Like if any of those games had gone, there would be all sorts of questions about who it belonged to, where the rights were, how things worked. Um, the main thing is to get it in writing. And I know that may bother some. He's like, oh, no, that's my best friend or my brother or somebody else. We don't need it in writing. We're too close. Get it in writing. Because then it's something that you can both agree to, or if you've got multiple people, agree to it. Figure out exactly where the license lies. Because that's the biggest thing with a lot of studios that they've complained about, is that, well, we had this game, it was a hit, we're ready to sell. But who owns that intellectual property? Is it the companies? Is it shared partnership between these people? And that causes a lot of issues. So just before you start anything, get something in writing. Even if it's just saying, for right now, it's going to belong here, here's our temporary contract. Whatever it is, get it written, have all parties sign it, uh, and then go from there. Uh, there's a lot of legal advice. You can check on that as well about how you can do percentages and everything else. I'm not an expert on that. Like I said, I've, I've prepared things. So like all the latest games I've worked on, we have things in writing beforehand. But I'd still like to see a lot more of that money come in to see if they work. So sorry, that's kind of a non-answer answer. answer. Um, and then was there a hand over here earlier? Or? Okay. One of the uh, pieces of advice you were saying was uh, don't get overwhelmed by list making. And a lot of the things that you're showing are, are things that I do in the, the notion of making a game. And uh, working on things on my own, there are so many variables. Uh, do you have any pieces of advice of how to specifically sort of keep your focus in the right direction and yeah. not be overwhelmed? Yeah. Um, the biggest thing is to ask the right questions. The big question with it should be, what do I need? Or, better yet, what, if I took it out, would destroy this game? Because if you can identify what those things are, like what's the core of this game, what's the heart of this game, that's the focus. If I take this out, will it still be the game I'm shooting for? Maybe I'm not going to get all these extra characters in, maybe I'm not going to get this dialogue tree in, maybe I'm going to have to cut this out, but what if I take it out is going to kill off my game? If this is like an RPG, if I take out that leveling system, is it still going to be the game I'm shooting for? Um, so just identifying what that focus needs to be in order to help share that overall gameplay experience um, will help you kind of focus in. And it's never easy. And a lot of these come down to like kind of personal choices and decisions. For you, though, what is it that needs to be in there to make this good? Maybe you're not going to get every particle system in, but will it still play the same way? will still work. So, any other questions? Oh, right here. You were talking about having uh, kids, and, and I can relate to that. Um, I've been developing, I'm a .NET developer, uh, 
I've been doing it in a professional sense for six years, uh, straight out of high school, and I can directly thank my game programming background for that. Um, but at this point, I am married, have three kids, and 50 hours a week working. Uh, so I was just curious how you juggle your your hobby or what you're trying to turn into a, a game development studio with family life as well. Well, for me, it's actually a couple different. It's never just one thing. So how many of you here have kids? Okay, so even if you plan this out and balance, ah, oh, I'll come home from work, <laughs> I'll be able to spend some time with my children, have dinner, put them to bed, and then I will have this time to myself in the evening. It never, ever, 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 ever goes like that. There's always, oh, okay, this one's sick, oh, this one's, you forgot to do your homework, okay, you know, and there's always things that come up. Um, the main thing is still to try and set some time aside for that, uh, whether it's getting up a little earlier, getting up or staying up a little later. Um, even for me, there are times where I have to take a few days off where I cannot work on game development because of needing to be there for my family or other obligations. But it's making sure that I am consistent. Same as the goal setting. You may not hit every action item. You may not be able to do it exactly on time every time. But try and be consistent. As much as you can, set some kind of a schedule. Um, for me, I find that the best times are when my kids are asleep. Either I have to get up earlier than them and do the work, or uh, in the evenings after they go to bed, finally, um, I'll stay up working on it. Uh, and, and weekends are fantastic for that. Fridays, oh. kids go to bed, wife goes to sleep, I can work till six in the morning. That's great! <laughs> um, and the other thing for me is I'm actually going through a few other things. And, and yet again, all of you are going to experience some of the things. I'm bipolar. So that's something that presents additional challenges. As part of that bipolar, you talked about focusing on uh, game design. I have trouble doing that. I've had to find a specialty. So I'm technically, my real skill set uh, is as a technical art lead. Um, but then from the art side, I'm an environment modeler. I would go crazy if I did just that all the time. So I, I kind of struggled in the game environment. So the thing that saved me was as a, a technical art lead at the studio, I was able to jump around to different things. And so I like to have that changing. And these are things that you're going to discover for yourself. Some of you may not have the attention for the specific thing you're thinking of doing. That's OK. Redirect, figure out your strengths and weaknesses, find your goals, and set them. So for me, indie development is fantastic because I get a shift around. I get a program sometimes, I get to do art sometimes, and I find that there's different times that are better, that are more productive. Uh, if I'm going to create art, for me personally, in the morning before my family wakes up, like right after I wake up, I go straight to drawing and painting and modeling and stuff. Extremely productive time for me. For programming, nighttime. Between about 11 and 2 in the morning is peak time for programming. And it's always two in the morning that you get the, either the aha moment, oh, this is what I've been fighting for the last few hours, or you go, okay, now it's time to go to sleep. I'll try another 15, 20 minutes, but after that, if I haven't resolved it, it's not happening tonight. And then being willing to go to bed. Music creation, Saturday afternoons. I can compose all Saturday afternoon without stopping. And it's just basically finding your balance and making sure that it is regular. So even though I shift around positions to be able to manage my own life and things like that, and I don't always get to, sometimes you have a sick child or whatever, staying consistent. Yeah, I missed tonight, I'm going to miss the next night, but the following night I'm going to be back to work on it. I'm putting in at least three to five hours. So just that kind of consistency. Uh, do we have the mic? Oh, okay. Just on the topic of all of the, you know, breaking down the goals into tasks and mm -hmm. having like a checklist, do you happen to know of anything better than Notepad to keep this information in so that you can check it off and keep track of what you've done, what you haven't done, and what you need to do next? Um, any type of tools, online, offline, free, expensive? Um, free is best. <laughs> Copy paper. And anything you happen to have to write with, pencil, pen. Uh, the, the problem with doing digital type planning is because then you're going, ah, oh, this is my schedule. And then we tend to get harsh because you spend a lot of time inputting that stuff <laughs> into a digital format. And when you finally get it all down, 
then something comes up and you have to change it. It's putting in a lot more time for a task that you just need to get out. Uh, I, I recommend just getting a stack of blank paper, start writing it. I draw a little check boxes so that as I go down, I do that. And then I go back to my list and say, okay, what were my larger goals? What were my next goals? I know it's very unorthodox, very untechy, but it works. It's cheap <laughs> and it, it helps you get your ideas out and then you don't feel bad if you have to go back and say, yeah, this isn't working so well. Let me restructure. New piece of paper. And, and, so, and also reevaluate your goals. Even if things are going perfect, whether on a project or in life or whatever else, they may or may not actually be going perfect. It's nice to go back and plan on, you know, Agile and Scrum, hey, on a team, you're checking every week or two to make sure that you're still on task, on goal. Uh, in life, do the same thing uh, every few months. I mean, don't wait till New Year's. Every few months, start reevaluating. Look at the longer term goals every year or so. Make sure that you're checking those regularly so that you can restructure and get back on task. So I think I'm out of time. So, thank you. all right, thank you.